Well, good morning, everyone. Oh, good morning, Pastor Liz. Good to see you. <laughs> well, I'm glad that you're here this morning. And nice to have some visitors. Some of my friends have come to cheer me on. Good to see them. And we're glad that you're in the service this morning. And if you're watching online, I pray that the Lord will speak to your hearts and for all of us that we'll get a message today from the Lord. I'm just going to now just to make a few announcements right now. There's a number of events that are happening. Oh, before I do that, I should tell you that. Um, I don't know if you know this or not. This is just kind of for your information. Some of my fashion gurus tell me that this is the last day I'm allowed to wear white. No, I don't know about that. I don't know about you, but I don't worry about that stuff. But if you're really into that, this is the last day. So if you have not something white on, you can go home, pull, put it on, and enjoy the rest of the day with it. <laughs> oh, well, my friends say it's today. <laughs> All right. Well, anyway, let me just make a few announcements. Uh, just a reminder, if you'd like to help out with the uh, children's ministry, uh, Kathy is looking for some treats, and I know some of you have already given those, but uh, keep in mind it has to be nut-free because a lot of the children have problems along those lines. Uh, also on September the 12th is Reconnect Sunday. We have a very special Sunday planned. Uh, Dora May is going to be singing, and there's, another, there's a number of other events that are happening on that day, and if you want to come early, have uh, some cookies and a cup of coffee or tea and just fellowship together. We hope you'll be able to plan to be there. And if you have a friend that you'd like to invite, that would be a good day for them to come. On September the 16th, just a reminder for the seniors, uh, Gail and Carol and I took a trip to St. Martin's this week just to look around, check out the area. We really want to encourage the seniors to come and uh, enjoy the day with us. And that is on September the 16th. There are so many great places there. There are art places, and there, there's a covered bridge, and uh, there are nice restaurants there, which we all enjoy. So I hope you'll keep that in mind. Sign up. There are a sign-up sheet out in, the, out in the lobby. One other item. I know you've seen all these, this information on the wall, but still it's good for us to say it out loud. There's a Bible study starting on September the 14th. Rick Costain will be leading that. So if you're interested, please sign up with that as well. Well, last night I was reading uh, some scripture from 1 John uh, chapter 1. That which was from the beginning, which we have heard, which we have seen with our eyes, which we have looked at and our hands have touched, this we proclaim concerning the word of God. The life appeared, we have seen it and testify to it, and we proclaim to you the eternal life, which was with the Father and has appeared to us. We proclaim to you what we have seen and heard so that you also may have fellowship with us. And our fellowship is with the Father and with his Son, Jesus Christ. We write this to make our joy complete. And I often think about the disciples and the people who were there with Jesus, how, how blessed they were to actually see him and, and to spend time with him and talk to him and ask him questions. But the Bible tells us that for those of us who have never seen him, we are even more blessed than they were because we believe in him. And so this morning, I want to encourage you uh, just to put aside all the concerns that you have. I know we all have worries and burdens today, but let's try just to put those aside for the next hour or two. Oh, not two, I'm just kidding. For the next hour or so, and uh, let's just let the Lord minister to our hearts this morning. Let's pray together, shall we? Father, thank you that on this day, on this beautiful, beautiful day, you are present with us. And we know that you've promised never to leave us and never to forsake us. And I pray especially for the service today, Lord, that you would just empower all the folks that are involved, that you would fill them with your gracious spirit, and you would allow us just to put aside our burdens and concerns. And maybe what we need to do is just give them to you right now, and say, Lord, I just, I want to be here in this service. I want to hear from you. And so I just commit the service to you now, Lord. I pray that you will bless, and I pray that our joy will be made more complete because we've been here this morning. In Christ's name I pray, amen. Amen. Good morning, everyone. Let's stand as we sing a few songs this morning. We're going to start with King of Heaven. It says, King of Heaven, come down. I don't know about you, but every time we turn on the news or watch anything today and see all the 
sadness that's going on around the world. I've been thinking more and more, oh Lord, please protect us, but I'm looking very forward to that day when I can see him face to face. So let's begin with a few songs here.
Another older one, uh, old hymn, Blessed Assurance. Um, and it says, This is my story. And I was thinking this morning, we all have stories, don't we? And I remember this as a young girl and thinking, I don't have a story as a young girl, but we do. Even though we are young, we do have a story. So let's uh, sing Blessed Assurance. <clears throat> Assurance, Jesus is mine. Oh, what a foretaste of glory divine! Heir of salvation, purchase of God, born of His Spirit, washed in His blood. This is my story. Submission, all is at rest. I in my Savior am happy and blessed, watching and waiting, looking above, filled with His goodness, lost in His love. This is my story. This time, Carolyn Matthews is going to come and read scripture. I'm glad Pastor Liz mentioned white. I thought it was the end of September. So, we're all out of black. Okay, our scripture reading this morning is going to be from Deuteronomy 4, 1 to 2, and 6 to 9. Now therefore hearken, O Israel, unto the statutes and unto the judgments which I teach you, for to do them, that ye may live and go in and possess the land which the Lord God of your fathers giveth to you. Ye shall not add unto the word which I command you, neither shall ye diminish aught from it, that ye may keep the commandments of the Lord your God, which I command you. Down to six. Keep therefore and do them, for this is your wisdom and your understanding in the sight of the nations, which shall hear all these statues and say, Surely this great nation is a wise and understanding people. For what nation is there so great? who hath God so nigh unto them, as the Lord our God is in all things that we call upon him for. And what nations is there so great that has statutes and judgments so righteous as all this law which I set before you this day? Only take heed to thyself and keep thy soul diligently, lest thou forget the things which thine eyes have seen and lest they depart from thy heart all the days of thy life, but teach them to your sons and your sons' sons. 
and then we go over well I guess we go over okay to James 1 17 to 27 every good and perfect gift is from above and cometh down from the father of lights with whom is no variableness neither shadow of turning of his own will begat he with us the word of truth that we should be a kind of first fruits of his creatures. Wherefore, my beloved brethren, let every man be swift to hear, slow to speak, and slow to wrath. For the wrath of man worketh not the righteousness of God. Wherefore, lay apart all filthiness and superfluity of naughtiness, and receive with meekness the engrafted word, which is able to save your souls. But be ye doers of the word, and not hearers only, deceiving your own selves. For if any man be a hearer of the word, and not a doer, he is like unto a man beholding his natural face in a glass. For he beholdeth himself, and goeth his way, and straightway forgetteth what manner of man he was. But whoso looketh into the perfect law of liberty, and continueth therein, he being not a forgetful hearer, but a doer of the work, this man shall be blessed in his deed. If any man among you seem to be religious, and bridleth not his tongues, but deceiveth his own heart, this man's religion is vain. Pure religion, and undefiled before God, and the Father is this, to visit the fatherless and widows in their affliction, and to keep himself unspotted from the world. Thank you, Carolyn. We're going to sing one more chorus before Pastor Liz comes, and I'm going to ask you to stand. This is a spirit song, and it's a song that encourages us to have an intimate relationship between us and Christ through his Holy Spirit. So I want us to sing this prayerfully this morning. Um, I've always uh, really found this song to touch my heart greatly.
Pastor Liz. I guess as we look back at this past year and a half, it's definitely been challenging. It's been discouraging. It's been demanding. And I suspect we could add some other words to it. It has been a year of the pandemic, the year of face masks, hand sanitizers, uh, social distancing and vaccinations. It is the, the year that will definitely stick out in the minds and hearts of every generation in the future. Many people have suffered socially and have suffered economically. Some people have found that their jobs were undervalued and that they were underpaid. And some others have found that their jobs weren't everything that they thought they would be. Listen to some of the quotes that people have made. 2020 was the year I bought a gallon of hand sanitizer. And I, I kind of was obsessed about that at the start too. I was washing my hands all the time. They told us to, right? Coronavirus has turned us all into dogs. We roam the house looking for food. <laughs> We're told no if we get close, too close to strangers. And we get really excited about car rides and walks. That's so true, isn't it? Day seven of social distancing. Struck up a conversation with a spider today. Found out he's a web designer. <laughs> After years of swearing that I couldn't clean my house because I didn't have enough time, 2020 has proven that that may not have been the reason. That's probably very true, isn't it? And I suspect this morning that all of us could add our particular quotes to some of the things that we've seen over this last little while. And uh, I guess one of the other things, and maybe you've heard this as well, people have talked about the coming of the Lord. I've heard that more and more. There's a lot of comments out there. Have you heard some of those? Anybody hear any of those? Jesus is coming soon. And some people are using the Bible to argue that the COVID-19 pandemic and other world events signify the second coming of Jesus Christ. There are some people who use the Bible to justify why they don't trust the vaccine. Uh, some say it initiates the mark of the beast, referencing, of course, the biblical book of Revelation. They claim it is a sign of the Antichrist. You may have heard that. We have seen Black Lives Matter protests, terrible fires out in the West, riots, senseless deaths of black men and women, shootings around our world, and you remember the shooting that happened in Nova Scotia. And of course, in the last several days, all the things that are going on in Haiti and Afghanistan, and throw into that uh, federal election. <laughs> and there's been uh, catastrophic flooding in Tennessee. And I'm not telling you all these things this morning to get you upset, but one day I did say to the Lord, you know what, Lord? I have actually reached my quota of sad news. And maybe you feel like that too. Some of you have turned off your TVs because you don't want to hear that news anymore. And lots of other things could be said about this, but I don't want us to be thinking about the pandemic today. And I'm not here to say that I think that this is I'm going to make some predictions about this, about when the Lord will return. But I, as I've been praying for my message today with the Lord, what I want us to do is to focus on where we are in our relationship with Jesus. And should he come today or in the next little while, would we be ready to meet him? Is our life in such a state that, yes, we are ready to meet Jesus the subject of Jesus' return has definitely taken a back seat, as we know, in many churches. And I probably can count on one hand the number of times I've heard about the second coming of Christ over the last 10 years. Carol Smith wrote a little paperback entitled Bible Prophecy Handbook. That's what she says. Many people consider studying the end times a curious and eccentric pursuit. Maybe some of you are feeling like that because we've had so many predictions about the second coming of Jesus and uh, people have been talking about it for so long. But I honestly believe that we cannot ignore all these things that are happening all around us. 
I, th I think it's kind of a, it's really a wake-up call, at least in my life it's been a wake-up call. Remember the little uh, game we used to play, hide and seek? And what did we say? Ready or not, here I come. And I think that's what Jesus is saying to my heart these days. Alexander McLaren, who was a, a preacher, and he wrote many commentaries, he says this, the apostolic church thought more about the second coming of Jesus Christ than about death or heaven. The early Christians were looking not for a cleft in the ground called a grave, but for a split in the sky called glory. They were watching not for the undertaker, but for the uptaker. And I think as you look back over history, you'll see that that is very, very true. So having said all of that, I, I'd like us to turn to a very familiar passage, which is found in Matthew 25, if you have your, your Bibles there. And it is the parable of the ten virgins, Matthew 25. I'll read the first 13 verses. At that time, the kingdom of heaven will be like ten virgins who took their lamps and went out to meet the bridegroom. Five of them were foolish and five were wise. The foolish ones took their lamps but didn't take any oil with them. The wise, however, took oil in jars along with their lamps. The bridegroom was a long time in coming, and they all became drowsy and fell asleep. At midnight, the cry rang out, Here's the bridegroom. Come out to meet him. Then all the virgins woke up and trimmed their lamps. The foolish ones said to the wise, uh, Give us some of your oil. Our lamps are going out. No, they replied, There may not be enough for both us and you. Instead, go to those who sell oil and buy some for yourselves. But while they were on their way to buy the oil, the bridegroom arrived. The virgins who were ready went in with him to the wedding banquet, and the door was shut. Later the others also came. Sir, sir, they said, open the door for us. But he replied, I tell you the truth, I don't know you. Therefore keep watch, because you do not know the day or the hour. Father, I just want to take a moment now and commit uh, this message to you. I pray that you will open my heart and the heart of each person who is here this morning. And may each one of us really look at our hearts and see if we are ready for that day when you will return and take all of the believers into your presence. Thank you, Lord, for this uh, really a reminder and also the good news that you are coming again. In Jesus' name I pray. I think if we're going to understand this parable, uh, we need to know a little bit about what was happening with marriages during the time of Jesus. Most rabbis propose that the age for a man to be married should be around 18. Uh, but if it was a lady, she could be around 13. And sometimes they were even younger than that. And we also know that, that marriages were arranged by, arranged by the respective parents. The view in the ancient world, and even in our world today, is that it wasn't about love. It was more about survival. One woman was asked if her husband lived up to the promises he made during his courtship days. This was his reply, her reply. Always in those days, he said he wasn't good enough for me. I'm just putting that in there to kind of wake you up here a little bit this morning. <laughs> for ancient Jews, marriage consisted of two ceremonies. There was the betrothal and the wedding, and each one was marked with a celebration that was separated by an interval of time, and it could be often between one and two years. And it was the groom's father who decided when the wedding was to take place. At the betrothal, the woman was legally married, although she remained in her father's house. The groom went back to his father's home, and he prepared a home for his new bride. And the wedding procession, of course, like our weddings, was loud and colorful, and there was a large parade of people, and it were people from all ages, from children up to, the, up to the elderly. The groom would make his way to the bride's home, and he would take her from, the, from her father's house and bring her to the house that he had prepared for her. So this, this bride was always ready. She was always waiting, living in expectation of his arrival. And she always kept the lamp burning, just in case he arrived in the middle of the night. In Jesus' story that I just read in Matthew 25, there were ten bridesmaids. They were called virgins because they had never been married. And they were to go out with the groom, go to the bride's house, and they were all celebrating together. It was very dark, and everybody who came was supposed to bring their own lamp. Well, 
the wise ones took a flask of oil because they wanted to really be prepared, but the foolish ones didn't do so. Finally, at midnight, the groom arrived, and you know the rest of the story. The foolish ones didn't have enough uh, oil, so they went to the wise uh, virgins and said, can you give us some of your oil? They said no, because they were afraid if they gave them their oil, they might run out themselves. They said, no, you go into town, and they would be able to go into town and buy oil at the night because most of the shops were open because of this wedding. But of course, we know the story. When they returned, they got their oil, they returned, and it says in here that the door was shut and they were not allowed to come inside. Jesus taught this, I believe, as an encouragement for you and I to keep watch and to be ready for his coming again. In verse 13, look at it again. Therefore, keep watch, because you do not know the day or the hour. We don't know the day or the hour when Jesus will return. But I want to just, from this passage, share three things with you this morning. First one is this, the Lord's coming fulfills a promise. The Lord's coming fulfills a promise. The Bible tells us over and over again that Jesus will return. There's no question about it. He's going to return. And the Old Testament prophets predicted a day of the Lord. They didn't know when that day was, but they knew that God had a plan for it all. And Jesus himself, of course, came on and he said, he talked about this future home in heaven that he had prepared for those who loved him. And the theme of his teaching was centered so many times on his coming again. And other New Testament writers said the same thing. Listen to some of these verses. Paul, when he heard about what was going on in Thessalonica, how the people were, were such strong believers, he wrote these words in verse chapter 1, 9, 10. For they themselves report to us what kind of reception you gave us. They tell us how you turned from idols to God, to serve the living and true God, and to wait for his son from heaven, whom he raised from the dead, Jesus, who rescues us from the coming wrath, Acts 1.11. This same Jesus who has been taken from you into heaven will come again in the same way you've seen him go into heaven. And a very familiar passage in 1 Thessalonians 4, 16, 17. For the Lord himself will come down from heaven with a loud command, with the voice of the archangel, and with the trumpet call of God, and the dead in Christ will rise first. After that, we who are still alive and are left will be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air, and so we forever will be with the Lord's. Well, I know this morning I'm not setting any dates. We, we can't set dates, of course. So many people have. But I think that we can look at some of the things that are going on in our world and recognize that the Lord's coming must be very, very close. In Matthew 24, and you've probably seen it before, but there's a number of things in there that talk about the second coming. There's various, there's other things in there as well, but I just want to pull out a few of the signs that are in the scriptures. The first one I want to mention is the increase of knowledge. In Daniel 12, 4, even to the time of the end, many shall run to and fro, and knowledge shall be increased. And haven't we seen an explosion of knowledge in the last 150 years? When we just look at what's going on, people are flying to the moon, people are traveling hundreds and thousands of miles, and look at technology is changing so quickly. Uh, there's great improvements in computer power, scientific discoveries in the medical professions. Think about the DNA. And how about this running to and fro? Isn't that our world today? We're getting on planes and trains and buses, and we're, we're, we're going to various countries, and all of us seem to be in this hectic stage of life. Do you find that? We're just kind of racing here, here and there. Another thing is the ability to enforce the mark. Revelation 13, 17 and that no man might buy or sell, saved he that had the mark, or the name of the beast, or the number of his name. And we need to have a worldwide financial system whereby everything that we buy goes through electronics. And we're, we're getting to that, aren't we, the cashless society? I hardly ever, care, ever carry cash anymore because they want us to use our cards. And I, years ago, I never thought something like this would happen. I thought I'd always have cash, and, and I would use it, eh? But they're really trying to make cash obsolete. Look at the headlines. Cash is dead. Are credit cards next? Smart cards, digital payments, cashless society. Technology isn't the mark, but it's definitely going to be used for enforcement 
of the mark. And to me, that is really a sure sign of our end times. And there's a falling away. In 2 Thessalonians 2, 3, let no man deceive you by any means, for they, that day shall not come, except there will be a falling away first. People abandoning God, people giving up on their faith, and I'm hearing about this all the time. Some friends that have just said, hey, I'm not interested anymore. Violence and sexual immorality. But as the days of Noah were, so shall also the coming of the Son of Man. And he talks about uh, in the days of Noah, they ate, they drank, they bought, they sold, they planted, they built. And yet they weren't following the Lord at all. And we can definitely see our society moving away from the biblical standards that are there. An increase in unpredictable weather patterns. Apparently there's, a, there's some terrible weather things going on even today in Louisiana. Earthquakes, floods, instant worldwide communication, move towards a one world economy, wars, nations fighting against one another, famines, gospels being preached in the whole world, a rise in spiritualism, false Christ, false prophets, and, and so many other things, folks, that have intensified over these years. And I, I'm not, we don't need to be obsessed by these things at all. We just need to keep our faith and our trust in Jesus and to know that he has a plan in all of this and we need to prepare for his coming. One day the disciples asked Jesus, well, when are, you, when are these events going to take place? And Jesus told them that no one knows that, only my Father who is in heaven. What is so exciting to me about these men and women in the biblical times that they didn't know when Jesus would return. But when you read the scriptures, it said it showed us that they have an attitude of constant expectancy toward his coming. And when you think about the story that I read, both the wise virgins and the foolish virgins both knew that the groom would come. They were, pre they, they were ready for that to a point. But the wise ones were more ready to meet him. So let me ask you this morning, are you prepared for his coming? I, I asked myself this question too. Am I prepared for his coming? In this parable, the requirement was that each person was supposed to meet the groom with a lighted, with a, a lighted torch. And of course, the very first way that we become prepared for the coming of the Lord is to put our faith and trust in him, to ask him to become our personal savior. God in his love has prepared a plan of salvation. And those who know him and are living for him should have no fear in thinking about his coming again. And just as these foolish virgins could not borrow any, any oil from the wise ones, so each one of us has to make our own choice for God. No one else can do that for us. We have to get prepared ourselves. When I stand before God, and I've probably said this many times before, I will stand alone. I won't have people coming over and say, oh, yeah, she's a good person. She did this and she did that. Romans 14, 12. So then every one of us shall give an account of himself to God. So Jesus warns us that, that we must be watching. And we are to live every day as if it could be our last day. I love the story of Susie. She was waiting for her boyfriend to come over, and she was all dolled up for him. And he was a whole hour late, so she figured, hey, he's not coming. So she took off her makeup, she put on her PJs, and got out a pint of ice cream and sat in front of the television. And guess what? After two hours, he returned. And listen to what he said. I'm two hours late, and you're still not ready. <laughs> That's kind of a cute little story, isn't it? But wouldn't it be a sad thing today if Jesus came? And we weren't ready to meet him. We weren't ready to, to stand in his presence. And maybe today you thought about being a Christian many times. Maybe you said, someday I'm going to become a Christian. Someday I'm going to believe in Jesus. For 2 Peter 3, 9, The Lord is not slow in keeping his promises. Some understand slowness. He is patient with you, not wanting anyone to perish, but everyone to come to repentance. He is giving people in our world every opportunity to be saved. And could it be that he tarries his coming because he wants to see more people come into the kingdom? Jesus will be fulfilling a promise. Secondly, his coming accomplishes a purpose. Why is he returning? When he first came into our world, he came to present himself as a savior of the world. 
We needed a savior. We needed someone to take care of our sins. But when he comes again, the Bible says he's going to come to judge all of our world. And I, I think all of us probably have a tendency to think we have all the time in the world. You know, we think, I'm, 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 I'm going to live forever. I'm not ready yet, but we don't have all the time in the world. We look at it and we say, well, Christ has, has delayed his coming. We've heard this story so many times, and we kind of, we get kind of lethargic about it. Isn't the grace of God something else? He's giving us all of this time for all people to be saved. Leads me to my final point. His coming encourages preparation. Jesus promised to return. He has a purpose in mind, and he wants us to be prepared. And this morning, if you are a believer, you've already put your faith and trust in Jesus, then you need to put on the Lord Jesus Christ. Make him a part of everything you say and everything that you do. Bring him into the decisions that you have to make. He wants to be Lord over your career. He wants to be Lord over all the times that you spend in this life, over what you hear and what you watch. And we easily reveal to people whether or not we're followers of Jesus by the way we live out our lives. I love what uh, G. Campbell Morgan, the preacher from the last century, said. The second coming is a perpetual light in the path which makes the present bearable. Folks, Jesus is coming again. Let's get ready, shall we? Amen. Let's stand.
let's pray together. Our Father, we thank you for this message of anticipation and warning. And we pray that as we leave the service today, you will help us to see vividly the spiritual realities that are going to press in upon us. And help us, we pray, to open our hearts so that we are ready and prepared. We ask it in Jesus' name. Amen.